Let me turn this down because it's really loud in here. We've got about maybe 30 or so people in my room here and about 43 people here. What did you guys think of the movie? We have some live, just clap. She can hear you. <laughs> uh, and um, let me tell you how this is going to run. First of all, welcome to Utah Valley University. Uh, I'm so sorry you're up so late in New York right now. <laughs> uh, if you start to get like sleepy and ready to call it, just let me know. Um, so thanks for staying up late with us. Um, this is a beautiful movie. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Then we're going to rotate between people in here who could come down and just talk to you on the computer here and people at home will just talk to you on uh, via Zoom. Uh, okay. And uh, my questions are actually not, not particularly relating to this movie. Um, the first question I have, I've been, you know, I'm a huge fan of Fosse Verdon um, and, uh, and, and I've been binging the Americans in preparation for talking to you today. And really it's not my area of expertise at all. And what I'd like to ask you about is the way that in television, you worked on these two wonderful shows that are such strongly written shows. Um, how does it, and I know sometimes you have a writing credit, sometimes you have a producing credit, but I imagine you're kind of have hands in the pot all the time. And I'm just kind of curious about how, how that sort of, how that writing room works where different episodes get assigned and different people are like producers. I honestly just don't know. I've been in the industry for a long time, but never in TV. And so, uh, so that's, I just thought students would be really interested in that. Uh, okay. So um, <clears throat> ideally on TV shows, what uh, in a writer's room, what you end up creating is basically a hive mind. Uh, so that you have a bunch of writers, so, you know, in America we had six or seven at any given time. And each writer, you know, has a unique voice, but our job is to speak as, as close to a uniform voice as we can. Uh, the voice of the show, the voice of the showrunners. And, um, but on the Americans in particular, and also on Fossey Burden, you know, sort of each writer had a, a particular skill or, you know, so that we could all sort of lean on each other. Like, for example, you know, there's a 10 year old, there was a 10 year old character boy, Henry, on the show. And there was happened to be a writer who had a 10 year old son. So whenever I, I needed something like that, I would go to him. And there was another writer who was a, a real expert in Soviet history in, in, the, in the 1980s. You could go to him. So it's, it's sort of about sort of working collectively uh, to create the product, you know, the, the, the product. And, you know, whenever you write a script, you know, other writers comment on it. You know, sometimes writers take a pass at your scenes, you take a pass at their scenes. The showrunners ultimately, you know, do their polish on it. Um, and you know there are there are moments when you have scenes that you really love and you remember, but you know in the best of circumstances, you know when you have the the finished product, you, you kind of don't even know because it's such a collective enterprise. Um, but uh, so, to me, that's how the best the best rooms work. How, how was that for you coming from, you know, playwriting, which is a very sort of solitary. Uh, well, I guess it sometimes is, sometimes isn't if you're workshopping it, but, but uh, was it a hard adjustment for you? Actually, it, it wasn't because I, when I did theater, I was, just, I was also, I was very collaborative. And as you said, there's also, you know, there's so many, it takes so long to get a play up. So you have workshop to workshop and notes to notes. So, you know, getting notes and collaborating with, you know, sort of, the designers and things like that. It was something I was I was I was familiar with, uh, so that that part of it was um, was a sort of a, the easiest transition, I'd okay. say. Great. Well, that segues from my my next question, which has to do with your playwriting. I I had, I, I took the pleasure of I took the pleasure I had the pleasure of reading uh, the story um, a few days ago, and I loved it. I haven't seen any of your plays before, but that was, that was a lot of fun. And I'm wondering, I saw in an interview with you before where you sort of aspired to be a playwright and then kind of found that that was a, a hard life and, uh, television kind of opened up and, you know, you've been kind of running at it ever since. Are there still some, are there still some parts of you that are like, yeah, this 
story is that this is for the theater and I still want to kind of do that or are you just kind of all in or, or are you compartmentalizing or how how are you approaching that uh yeah actually that that, uh, that does happen there is a play I have in my head that I I can't I'm trying to get it out but I I, I can't I, I thought I was sort of done with theater but sometimes it, it the idea just sort of hits you yeah. and um you know as you know, theater is just such a chaotic place right now. Um, but you know, there's this. Uh, there was some. There was something that was. Even though I, I couldn't make two cents doing it, <laughs> but there's something very exciting about doing live theater and and that collaborative that collaborative process. And uh, there's just sort of nothing like that. I mean, you know, being on set and being on a TV and movie set, it's, it's also very exciting. But it's not the same as as the, the sort of the spontaneity, you know, literally you don't know what's going to happen from night to night. And, and um, there's this a part, there's a part of me that I think will always uh, want that. Excellent. Okay, well, I, I'm going to let students take over now. If you guys in the room, queue up here, all right? And uh, we've got some names coming uh, uh, in, in my chat. So, you know, the chat just goes straight to me so they, they don't get this. Okay. So uh, the first person up here is Joseph Hart. And when you, when you pop in, make sure we can see your face, but also introduce yourself to Tracy so she knows who you are. Joseph, are you with us? Oh yeah, there you are. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I kind of had a similar question. I mean, I, I was going to ask her about the relationship with other writers as you, know, you work on a series or something, because I've noticed that with series, it's not always the same person that writes all the episodes. Um, and so you kind of talked about that idea when you were talking about like writers, you described it kind of like a hive mind. So that was the question I was going to ask because um, I was curious about that relationship between writers and how they worked on a series to create like a coherent story. I, I, uh, I know nothing about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I was, I was actually talking, I was talking, I was mentoring with a, a group of writers uh, today and I, I would just say that uh, I think that TV writing or any any writing in the industry is is a constant uh, lesson in humility. Uh, you know, you just have to just sort of because you have to. There's a lot of voices coming out of you at, at you, and in TV, regardless, you are going to you know you, you're going to be written because the, you know you can only imitate someone's voice so so far. You know, and so you, it's, it's it's a constant learning process and a constant you know s sort of having to be open uh, to hearing a lot of other voices and a lot of uh, other notes. Um, but I think sort of, like I said, sort of the best shows are, are shows in which the writers are able to sort of come together um, and sort of it, it, it just really focused on one goal and really able to sort of let go of their different egos and just want the best for the show. Okay, thank you, Annie. Just that. Hi. Um, so I so I heard that you had only a few months to hey, write this. Who you are. Oh, I'm Annie. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was wondering, uh, since you only had a few months to write this movie, Respect, um, I was really curious about research. Like I'm sure that researching this was so much fun, um, but you had so little time. Were you able to talk to family members like were you able to do that firsthand or did you have to go through researchers how did that work well luckily um yeah the the process was insane um just because I, of when I was hired and when they were scheduled to shoot everything but uh, they had a you know they was the studio they had a researcher they had a researcher who had you know there was just a Dropbox just full of information. If I needed anything it was very yeah, I've never had this experience I could just call up and say I need xyz and I would get it in an hour. So that made things, um, you know, sort of much easier um, when, when I got aboard, just, just to be able to just say, does this even exist? As opposed to, you know, sort of having to dig it up all on my own. But yeah, the research um, was, was very, was, was the best part of it because I actually didn't know that much about her. I thought I did, uh, but I didn't know, I didn't know, I basically didn't realize I didn't know anything. Awesome, thank you. All right. Um, 
We have Roan on board here. Hi. Hey. Hi, thanks so much for joining us uh, tonight. One thing I hear a lot uh, from some of the screenwriting classes that we offer here and, and just kind of in general when screenwriting is brought up is how having too many lines of action or dialogue or just kind of having a noticeably bulky pattern or paragraph of action or dialogue can be something that causes a producer to instantly not green light your project. And I'm curious if that's something that's been a challenge for you and how you've worked around that. Um, well, first of all, first of all I will say, it, you know, I, I don't um, I don't necessarily know that that will stop a producer from producing your project. You know, it could be anything. It could be a bad day. It could be, you know, whatever. Um, so don't be don't be terrified of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, actually doing this, this um, you know, I respect this is my first movie. And um, in the same way, I had a big learning curve when I was when I was transitioning from playwriting to TV. <clears throat> I didn't understand uh, all of my plays have very sp sparse stage directions, almost no stage directions. They just say who's entering and, you know, who's speaking. And so when I wrote my first uh, script for TV, I was, it, was, uh, it was for an hour and typically it was a network show. So typically the script should be between 48 and 32, 52 pages. And my script came in at 32 pages, my first draft. And it was because I didn't understand I had to write for production. I didn't understand that I had to, people actually had to know what it is, the sets they had to build and where it had to be and all this kind of stuff. And so, and so, and so when I was writing Respect, um, I had four scenes in a row that were all, I had a lot of scenes in a row actually that were all interior. And the producer was like, "You have, we have to get outside. This is not a play. You, you have to. We have to have some, some exterior scenes. We have to." So there, there was a definitely that process. But I, I do say yes. More white space is, 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 is good because. But you, can, you also have to make room for the director. You know, I mean, you, you write a script and the director will you know, look at it and, and see, see a, maybe a couple that have seen and, and know that they can make that to something visual. Um, so, you know, you don't have to sort of get bogged down and, you know, of course you should never get bogged down in camera angles or anything like that. But it's, it's you, 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 you should write the script that you, you need to write and trust that the director will, plus, trust me, there'll be plenty of people who have hands on it. Who will, will tell you when you can do something visually? And as you write, you'll you'll sort of uh, sort of start to start to understand that naturally. Thank you. That's very helpful. And I love the movie, by the way. Oh, thank you. I don't know your name, Saxon. Oh, you're Saxon. Yeah. We've only met one time. Did you? Here you go. Sorry. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Saxon. Um, I'm in the directing track and I've actually never talked to a playwright before. And so I wanted to know, <laughs> I wanted to know how your experience playwriting affected, um, your screenwriting for this movie. Um, well, time I wrote, I, I, guess, I guess I hadn't, uh, hadn't had a play up for about five years, but I would say that I think. I always, um, whenever I'm writing something, I always like to read a read a play before I write anything, that just to keep my feet in that. But you know, um, theater is just great for dialogue, and um, as I'm sure you guys know, um, a lot of movies don't have great dialogue. Um, you know, it's just that the thing about theater is that you can't have bells and whistles, a lot of bells and whistles, yeah, just for the pure expense of it. You know, you know, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child kind of stuff is, is sort of rare on Broadway or Lion King's kind of things. It's usually just about two people talking. So that was that was just sort of uh, sort of really helpful just to, uh, and, and there's also something about the economy of theater, um, you know, so that, you know, we have these scenes that you could just sort of, you know, my my, I was always taught in theater to get in late and get out early, and that and that is uh, that is a good lesson in uh, in film to get in as late as possible, get out as early as possible. So those those are those are things that I was able to uh, take with me uh, in the scenes I wrote for this movie. Thank you. 
Tracy, you're very good at concise answers. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> next, uh, let's see, Joseph Rohn, Z uh, Zanza. And I hope I'm saying your name right. Yes, it's Zanza. Hi. Hi. Um, I have my iPad turned the wrong way. But, um, my question is, so the music, the movie has a lot to do with music. Um, what do you, what background, if any, do you have in music? Because I feel like it really got through with the way that music is so healing um, and like how much it has to do with a person's life. So I just wanted to know like what background, if any, you have in that. Well, only that I grew up listening to her music and like her music was a soundtrack of my life. You know, uh, my, my grandmother used to listen to the Amazing Grace album every, uh, she lived with us every Sunday. And so I, I, I was very familiar with the music, but I also, we also had access to really great uh, music supervisors um, who uh, I was able to sort of ask any question about what it was, what it was like in the studio, like that whole uh, you know, scene of, of making I Never Loved a Man. Um, actually, the, 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 two of the original musicians were alive at the time and they came to set that day to, to sort of watch the filming. And they were just like, literally they were like, that guitar is wrong or I was standing over there and that was, that was actually really helpful. But the music supervisor was really helpful, just especially in terms of helping me to understand what was, you know, used, you know, the period, the period instruments that they were using and things like that. So um, those guys really helped me to, um, uh, to make it authentic. And the actors we had, I mean, uh, also um, played, uh, played instruments as well. So that was also really helpful. And we got to rehearse with them um you know uh, with the dialogue uh and the music that was really helpful awesome were, thank you were those rehearsals going on while you were writing were they prepping the music like consecutive i mean at the same time simultaneously oh yeah i mean i was i was i was writing up until the last day of shooting <laughs> yeah it was ongoing hey tracy i'm jordan hi I got two questions for you. Uh, one's a follow up to the, the previous one. So I'm just wondering how, um, when writing when writing a script, um, how writing music into it worked um, with with how musically, um, I can't think of the word, how, how musical this film was. Um, what were the kind of challenges or how did that work for you? Uh, the idea was when me and the director, Lisa Tom, we talked about, um, Having each having all the songs could be connected to an emotion in the film, mm -hmm. so so that uh, every because everything that Aretha did was was so was so personal and and music was something that saved her life, and um, so it was it was about which songs and and which songs fit the you know the the, the time that we were in the the moment that we were in you know. Um, and so that that's sort of how we chose. And, and if we had a song that we, we knew we had to put in, obviously we had to have respect. You know, how did that tie into what she was going through at that time? Um, so it was, it was all about connecting the, how does the emotion of the song connect to the character? As opposed to just saying, okay, now she's saying this hit, now she's saying that hit. So that the audience is connected to the, to the songs emotionally, as emotion, emotionally as, as Aretha is. Okay. Um, and then my next question is, um, having been a playwriter, um, what were some of the challenges or was it easier going to like a feature film uh, script writing? Uh, I, I think, I, I don't think it was easier just because it, the, I had to write it so quickly. So, well, I will say, I think, so when you're in theater um, and you have previews, you have to rewrite a lot, right? You, you go and you see it in front of an audience and then it, you, something doesn't work. And so you have to have pages but for the next day, by the next day. So for the writers to rehearse so they can do it that night. And so that was actually very helpful because I had to write very fast. Yeah. And, um, and also in, uh, in, in TV, there's a, that also happened in TV because there's a lot of sort of quick turnaround and rewrites, especially when you're in production. So I, I would say that, that, te that theater did help me to um, sort of be able to write on the fly. Cool, thank you. All right, how are you holding up? I'm holding up. Good, <laughs> night owl, Carrie. 
Kerry Levy. Hi, so is, is my mic working? Yep. Okay, cool. So Tracy, I was actually, I was super impressed with the dialogue heavy scenes in that film. And I can see how like your, play, your playwright uh, experiences really came into play when writing for this film. But my main question was, how did you approach the challenge of writing dialogue for a biopic, especially like something that involves like historical care, a historical person and someone who is as influential as Aretha Franklin. So how did you approach writing dialogue for stuff that either was said or wasn't said, like actually? Um, yeah, that was, um, that actually, that's a great question because I actually, that was a big challenge uh, because, uh, you know, her, her relationship with Ted, she was a very private person. So there wasn't a lot uh, of information about that. Uh, so it was really, and in, in, in this sort of goes back to the research question uh, about sort of gleaming what you can about, it's, it's about making a scene that's based on a truth, even if the, the scene might not have actually happened, if that makes any sense. So, you know, what I knew, what I knew from about Ted and Aretha's relationship is that, you know, that he was, uh, he was a, he, he was a pimp um, and that he loved her very much to the point of obsession. And there was a lot, there was a lot of videos that I saw when uh, of them two together. And while it was, there was some stuff that was clearly kind of creepy, there was also this an, an, an enormous amount of love in his eyes for her, and especially when she sang. And so it was about conveying that passion and conveying that. And just if you if you have a scene that conveys that truth, then you are then you are telling a truth about who she is. And it was the same thing with her sisters, understanding that her relationships with her sisters was full of great love, but also jealousy. So it was, it was about uh, recreating uh, the, the truth of the relationship, even if, the, even if the, in the scenes, as opposed to, you know, just oh, this, this having to follow exactly sort of uh, what happened at any given time. That's amazing. Thanks so much. Karen. Sure. Hey, Tracy, I'm Jared. Um, Hi. The post-production the post track here. I'm also a little bit interested in writing. Uh, I've always been one that likes to write ever since I was growing up. But I, well, my question, kind of similar to the previous person's question uh, a little bit, is in relating to, to writing biopics, because it's obviously a little bit different to writing your previous work, even though it's your previous work's also very based on history with like the Cold War and all other stuff. Um, but what is like the, the challenge you had of like choosing the, what, what themes to write about in, in about Aretha Franklin's life, if this makes make any sense. Right, let me rephrase the question. What was this, the struggles you had about writing um, in terms of like the themes that you chose for this biopic about Aretha Franklin that would be the most appropriate for her life, if that makes any sense? Yeah, yes, no, it, it, does, it does make sense. I, I, I think for some, so for some, I watched a lot of uh, musical biopics in preparation for this. And uh, for some strange reason, I don't know why, a lot of musicians' lives follow a very similar trajectory. Uh, you know, <laughs> True. Uh, talent at a very young age, um, you know, uh, very personal hardships, uh, quick success, rise, fall, you know, it sort of, when it, for whatever reason, it sort of follows this sort of thing. So, uh, but I think the, sort of the, the best biopics that I that I saw uh, were ones that uh, just like in the best films you see are that they have a, a question that they're trying to ask, answer, right? And so the question was, how does a woman with the greatest voice of all time find her own voice? And so once you sort of decide that that's the question you want to answer, then you just decide what is the time frame in which I can do that? Because obviously I'm not going to go from age 10 to age 75 when she passed away. And so it was, you know, from age 10 to age 30. So for the start of her, the start of her career, which was basically at age 10, up until the, the biggest success of her career. Because at the end of the movie, she sort of starts, she's out of her way to becoming the Aretha Franklin icon that we all know. Mm -hmm. So I just think that with, with anything, uh, biopic or whatever, it's, it's about what, what, it is, what question is that you're trying to, to answer for the audience. Oh, awesome, thank you. And I think Mr. Alex Nibley is next. Alex, are you here? I say and thank you so much for staying up late to talk to us and sharing your movie with us. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I teach screenwriting here at UVU. 
And uh, we have a, a lot of students who are working on either series projects or feature length projects. And I, I know that there's, you know, there's a little secret that um, writers tend to have little rituals that they do when they go into their writing process. And, and I love to collect those and share them. I, I'm wondering if you could share some of your process and how you go about it. And uh, if you have any little special things that you do when, you, uh, when you're working on a project. Um, yes, I'm, a, I'm a, actually a big believer in ritual and um, I think it helps. Uh, this, this sort of process because you have nothing else you can fall back in your ritual. So whenever I'm starting something new, I have to find that the right notebook to use and I have to find the right pen. So, and then once that's done, um, I, you know, I, I do my sort of, I do my research and so let, let that absorb. Um, and this is, this is when, this is assuming I have the luxury of time. If I have the luxury of time, I don't have a deadline. And then um, when I sort of, can't stand it anymore, then it, it's, I, I start to write. And I can't write straight from my head. When I start to write, I can't do it straight from my head to the computer. I have to write longhand for a little while. Mm -hmm. So I write longhand. And then um, when I get exhausted with that, then I type up what I wrote. And then while I'm typing and I'm editing it, then from there, I'll go just to the computer. And then um, I usually try to read, uh, if I'm running, working on a screenplay, uh, a screenplay a day, start my day reading a screenplay before I write, just to get you know something similar to what it is I'm trying to do in the screenplay, just so I can get a, a certain rhythm in my head, or I'll just read something that I really love. And I also um, always listen to Miles Davis, uh, Kind of Blue, uh, when I when I first start writing. <laughs> That's the secret. Great. That's the secret. I love that. And all my students, see what I mean. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Preston Weaver. I'm going into the cinema track, but I, um, I also write some advertisements and stuff like that for small companies. And so I'm always so interested in like character development and in your TV shows, as well as in the movie Respect you have a way of creating such emotion. And like, I can, I feel like I feel the thoughts and the emotion of a lot of the characters, but that's something that I've struggled with is like trying to, like, I feel the emotion myself, but I don't know how to put that on paper, you know? And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering what mm -hmm. kind of advice you might have for us that like, we're trying to get those character to, characters to resonate with us or the audience. Um, that's a great, that, that's another great question. and. I really think it's sort of about observing, you know, I think you have a lot of, a lot of it in you anyway. It's like, so it's observing the people around you, observing, you know, uh, the, you know, the, whatever it is, whether it's your colleagues, your friends, your family, you sort of know them in a way. And, and I think that all those things sort of come out in, in the writing. Um, you know, I think, when you, when you, um, you know, you don't have to know everything about your character as you're writing, but one thing I have found that, that just in terms of ritual, one thing I have found that is always very sort of helpful in order to sort of help me to get that character is that just to, I just jot down before any project scenes I want to see. And so, so for example, it could be anything. It could be, I see a guy with brown hair and he's eating cereal at, at, his, at, his, at his table. And I just write all the scenes that I, I want to see. It could be 10 scenes. It could be 50 scenes. And once you do that, once you've exhausted that, you'll start to see a pattern. You'll actually start to see a story because we are always, always, always creating stories in our head, whether or not we are acknowledge it or not. And then from there, you start to, I think you, you'll start to organically start to get a sense of who this person might be. So as opposed to you sort of imposing something on it, if you just trust your imagination and just say, what, what do I want to see? What do I want to see? And it could be the smallest thing. 
So you might let nothing uh, lead to anything and it might not even stay in there, but it'll be something that sort of will sort of inform, inform the character. I mean, Quentin Tarantino says that, you know, with all his characters that he knows, you know, what they were like in the eighth grade, whether or not it gets in the script or not. And maybe sometimes you will have those sort of details with the character, but, you know, you don't have to sort of get, um, it's, you know, you, you don't have to get sort of too bogged down and, and you know, on a, a right way or wrong way to do it because the, the characters you're creating are actually all around you. Because um, there's another saying that, you know, once a, once a writer is born, the family is finished. And I, and, I, and I also believe that that's true because it's your family, it's your friends, it's all, it's all of that. And if you just sort of, um, just sort of trust, trusted your imagination, I, th I, th I think that the, the characters could come organically in that way. Awesome, thank you so much. I love the movie also. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have a, if I could count one, two, three, Oh, a bunch of people jumped on. How are you holding up? I'm holding up. <laughs> oh, um, Sebastian is next. People are, people are. Uh, All right, test. Does the mic work here? Yes, it does. All right, sweet, sweet, sweet. All right. Um, so I guess like the previous questions answered it, but, um, but I guess I'm just going to um, go back to the original question I had. Um, any aspire any any advice for starting starting writers and that want to get into the industry like how how they want to go about it um I go. yeah i mean you know um I, I i this sounds like a little bit of a cliche but i i'm saying it because i i, I do believe it's true and uh, because i spent a lot of time uh early in my career uh trying to write what i thought people wanted to to mm -hmm. hear uh, or wanted to read, and that never worked. Um, and I, I do believe uh, truly that if uh, you write what it is that you love, that uh, everything else will follow. Um, you know, and and you guys are at a really unique time right now in the industry, and just in terms of the volume of of shows and the you know and the volume of product out there, and that doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. And there's just a there's just a lot of opportunity to, for people, people who are just uh, clamoring to hear things that they haven't seen before. Mm. So I would just lean into um, writing what you are afraid of. Writing what I'm afraid of. I've never heard that yeah. before. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. That's because awesome. that, that is, uh, that is, because what you're afraid of is, is you're not, you, it's universal. Mm -hmm. I mean, the circumstances are unique to you, but that whatever that is, is universal and that will speak to people. Okay. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Okay. Hi, can you see me? Great. Yep. So my name is Dana and I had a question. So I danced for like 10 years and when we have a big recital, they would work on the finale first, so it was perfected. And so I'm wondering with a movie, especially like Respect, where it has kind of this big finale and such an important message, do you work backwards or like puzzle piece it together? How do you make it so big, you know? Yeah, well, that, that's funny because um, uh, whenever I write anything, uh, I have to know what the ending is uh, or else I can't. I have difficulty going. At a certain point, I have to know what the ending is. Um, and usually the ending will change, but I have to know that I'm running towards something and what I'm running towards. Um, so uh, yeah, it is actually, I guess, very similar to dance in that, you know, even if it's, even if it's just a placeholder, I'll, I'll just know that. And it also helps you to know that, okay, at least when I hit this, I could hit this, this mark, I could stop. And then I could go back. So I think, you know, that's, you know, some people are different. Some people just like to write until, the, you know, they, they can't anymore. But I, that's just not me. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, Braxton, I believe. Braxton, I think. 
Yeah, hi. Um, we could, I didn't expect to get up here, but all right. Um, he asked, how do I ask a question? And so I guess that means you have one. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Tracy, hell of a first feature. First off, thank you. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, you were talking earlier, and this is kind of just impromptu, but you were talking earlier about how there were some scenes you wanted, like scenes you want to see when you're writing something. So I'm curious, were there any of those that really stuck out to you while doing Respect? Oh yeah, there was a bunch of scenes um, I, I wanted to see uh, that didn't get, I mean, the first cut of the movie was five and a half hours, uh, and I did a cut. Uh, so uh, there was a there was a lot more stuff with the sisters that I wanted. There was a lot more stuff with uh, Ted. Uh, you know, there was just there was just a lot just a lot of stuff uh, because it was because it was my first movie because I wrote it so fast. Um, I wrote you know I wrote too much, and so and because they they had to to shoot it, they ended up you know shooting a, a lot more than I think that they sort of normally would if I had a sort of like a normal. Uh, process. Um, so uh, yeah, there's always going to be. There's a, that's just that's gonna, that's always there's always going to be those those scenes that you you wish you could have had, but you, you know for reasons outside of your control, you can, you just can't do it. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, looking forward to seeing what you do in the future. So thank you. Good luck. Okay, and uh, I believe it's Ethan Whitmore. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, my question might be kind of simple, but and maybe previously someone answered. But I just want to know, how did you like? How did you decide where to end the story when you did? Because, uh, like, obviously Aretha Frank has a very large life. I'm just wondering, like, how did you figure out this will be the end of the story? Um, because I, it, I think uh, the moment when it ended answered the question of the movie because because she found she found her own voice at that moment when she made that amazing grace album she produced it it was the first album that she produced she produced it herself um she had gotten out of her abusive relationship she stopped drinking it was like it was uh it was sort of the perfect way to to uh, the perfect place to end it because it 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 dealt with the the, the question of the movie at that moment Okay, thank you. And let's move to Jesse. Jesse did not give me a last name, so hopefully there's only one Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse. Um, so what I was wondering, um, because when I first decided that I wanted to get into filmmaking, um, I was trying to think which part did I want to do? I wasn't sure in what way I wanted to be involved. And when thinking maybe I want to um, be a writer, um, writing movies, um, but I thought that that could be something that could be frustrating because as I understand it, um, other people take your work and could change it if they want to. And so what I was kind of wondering is what that is like, like uh, were there parts of like the Respect movie where you kind of like thought like, hey, that's not how I meant that part to be. Uh, and if so, like how that, what what kind of is that is like? Well, I, I was very um, lucky in that um, the director Lisa Tommy is, is one of my closest friends. And uh, when we were filming in Atlanta, they put us up in the same house together. So we were literally together 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week, which could have been a nightmare, but it wasn't. Uh, so, and we were also, we were very much on the same page creatively. So there was, but there was a lot of uh, back and forth with, with these producers. I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat it. There was just a lot of very passionate voices and, and, and fights in the room, but that that is gonna be, you know that's going to be how it is in the entertainment business. There's no there's no job in TV or film, whether or not you are a director or a producer, where you don't have to uh, fight for your vision. Um, you know, uh, maybe maybe I guess I guess maybe Steven Spielberg or 
or Scorsese, those guys, maybe now finally they get final cut of their movies and things like that. But, you know, most for everybody else under that, you know, there's there, there are people who are telling you, you know, you have to cut for this, you have to do this, you have to do that. So that's just that's just something that you're just going to have to learn how to uh, to deal with, whether or not you are a writer or a producer or a director. There's no sort of job where anybody just gives you millions of dollars and just leaves you alone. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Dio. Perfect. Um, so I have a question just a little bit about when you were in school, when you were in Temple. Uh, I just, we, we did a little research on you and everything else like that. So um, one, one of the facts that caught my eye was that you knew very little about theater growing up. How did you make the decision of going into theater just with that connection, how did you make that connection when you didn't know that much about theater? Uh, well, I um, I thought I was going to be a, I still thought I was going to write fiction, and I thought I was going to write the Great American Novel, and um, I was not doing well with that, and so I had writer's block, and I took a playwriting class uh, in New York. And um, as soon as five minutes into that class, I realized why I was getting all these rejections for my novel. And it was because I was writing plays all the whole time without knowing it. You know, I wasn't really interested in uh, sort of description or metaphor or anything like that. I wanted to just get to the plot and I wanted to get to the dialogue. And so I realized it's just in that time, oh, this is, this is, this is, this is what, what I was sort of meant to be. It was kind of like sort of a love at first sight kind of deal. Um, and then as soon as I realized that, I just completely immersed myself in theater and just uh, just sort of be, just became sort of consumed with it. I saw everything I could. I read everything I could. Um, and so I, I just realized that that was my path until, of course, I realized that you can't actually make a living in theater. So and then luckily, sort of TV opened for me. But what made you want to take that theater class? Was it just like a... I guess, or? No, it was because um, I had writer's block and I knew I was too intimidated to take a fiction writing class um, because I was afraid that I would, it, it, you know, what, what happens if I, I still can't write after taking it. So I wanted to take something that I thought I was not interested in at all because all I wanted to do, it had been over a year since I had written anything. And that was a, sort of the longest I had ever gone since like the fifth grade, not writing. So I thought I'm going to take something um, that, you know, um, would just allow me to put some words on a page so that I could just sort of get, and I thought that that would help me get back to, to writing novels, but then I realized I didn't want to get back to that at all. Okay, cool, yeah. That, I just wanted to see how you made that connection like with that. Thank you. All right, Isaac, we have, we have two, we have two, uh, and maybe three. <laughs> okay. How you're doing? We'll see. I'm I'm doing all right. All right, Isaac. Hi. I do. Can I be heard? Yep. I mean heard. Okay. I, I do apologize. My monitor does not have a camera. In an interview you did with Classical Theater of Harlem, I believe you did mention your relationship with your father and his health conditions around the time you started writing in plays and such, did some of that uh, become a catalyst for why you decided to work on respect? And did you bring any of that out of your own relationship with your father into the scenes between Arisa and her own father? This is a great question. Yes, absolutely. My, because my father was a, a minister um, and no, we're nothing like, you know, Aretha's father. Um, he, we did, he didn't even have a church. He just did weddings and stuff like that every once in a while. But I saw, but I knew a lot of preacher's kids. I was familiar with that world. And so I absolutely, and I was also very much a, a daddy's little girl. And so I was, I, I was very much drawn to Aretha's uh, relationship with her father and the complexity of that relationship with her father. And uh, I understood her, her need to uh, want to please him and her need to, you know, sort of, you know, uh, subsuming her identity within his. So all that was um, a sort of, uh, I was able to sort of use my, my personal relationship there uh, and, 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 and adapt it to Aretha's uh, unique circumstances. 
Wonderful, thank you. Is that part of writing what scares you? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, Skylar. Uh. Hi, can you hear me? I can. All right, hi. So uh, I'm Skylar Smith, um, and I actually come from more of a theater background. This is my first semester in film. And I was just wondering, because I've had interest in playwriting before screenwriting, I was just wondering if you had any advice for someone who wants to try to uh, attempt. I'm sorry, you broke up just a little bit towards the end there. Oh. So, someone who wants to. To uh, kind of straddle the line with playwriting and screenwriting. Oh, oh yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm sure that theater will, will you know, will 100% sort of bounce back now, but the, the lines, uh, you know, when I first started out, it was, it was still very novel for uh, playwrights to be hired for TV. Um, but now that, that sort of line is completely falling down and they are, you know, producers are constantly looking to theater, um, yeah, to, you know, to theater, to staff shows and things like that, because what they like is that, um, you know, traditionally playwrights are, are good with dialogue. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, they, they, they look for. So I just think that, that, that those, those lines, those hard lines that used to be there are just, are just really uh, just much more porous now. And, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, and in, in you know the film stuff is actually bleeding now into theater. A lot of theater stuff is actually more like TV, um, and so it, it's I, I wouldn't even worry about those lines anymore because I just think that they're all they're all just blending and blurred. Awesome! Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so our final question. I actually have a very small question. I'm going to ask when we're all done, but our final question is. Um, I'm sorry, a few people have kind of snuck in really recently, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them wait for another person because it's just, I feel really bad about you being up so late. No, it's okay, seriously, it's okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's have Ginny McKenzie ask a question. She's one of my colleagues here. Hi, Tracy. I run our documentary track and I loved the, uh, so just doing research in this story and, Aretha, the film was fabulous. The screenplay is beautiful. And I'm also the daughter of a playwright and I'm still, oh. in, re still in recovery because of that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I love the way you talked about the question. And I always talk with our students about that, really setting up the dramatic question. And the first act is so amazing in particular, that beautiful scene with her mom, with the amazing Audrey McDonald, whom I adore. And so that scene where she is told not to, you know, ever let a man, I mean, and that scene, the way you wrote it, did you write it with sort of them singing that gospely mother-daughter conversation? Like, did you write that? How, how did that happen? And, and talk about the setup and how beautiful, that was six minutes into the film. Well, that was actually um, one of the um, my one of the greatest experiences writing that scene because uh, Audra came in and she met Sky for the first time and we were in a rehearsal room and we had the pianist there and um, I actually wrote the scene and edited the scene with them there singing back and forth because we were trying to decide oh. what, what songs they were going to sing oh. and um, being in that space was so helpful that it's so and it's so informed the scene because I would tell you that uh, 10 year old Sky when she saw Audra her eyes were just like <laughs> this and her father's eyes were twice as big and um, she was the way she was just staring at her with such awe because this is what she wants to be yeah you know and so seeing that um, 
just naturally led us up to, to, you know, the relationship between Aretha and her mother, you know, just this, this awe and this complete love. And I have to say, Audra, when she heard Sky sing was completely, was completely blown away uh, by her range and by her, um, the, the depth of her voice. Um, you know, at a certain point, um, you know, there was, you know, they were doing some sort of back and forth and uh, the, uh, the music guy said, to Sky, you know, he gave her he gave her a note, and Sky was just basically like, "Well, how high do you want me to go?" And why did you start laughing? Just like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> you were just gonna, you know." And it sort of became this little playful competition between them. So that was just really uh, such a great honor, just to sort of see that and to and to build the scene around, uh, you know, their actual relationship. Beautiful, beautiful. Any tips for students just around really getting that set up? early so that we understand kind of, you know, the stakes and the journey. I mean, that scene is so pivotal as well as the one with her music uh, gospel teacher, but any tips for our students about that? Yeah. I, I mean, I would just say it, 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 you know, just to be constantly asking yourself what, what it is that you, what it is you're trying to say. And I just can't keep going back to the same thing. It's like a broken record, but what is the question you're trying to answer in this yeah. movie? Every movie has a question. Yeah. Uh, every great movie has a question and movies that don't have a question meander. And you, you, yes. can, you can see that. Yes. And whether it is, and it could be from, and it could be a Marvel movie or it could be some you know, small independent movie. And so if, if, you, if you, once you figure that out and you don't have to figure it out right away, you know, so maybe you just, you know, write a bunch of scenes and you don't know yet, then it, then it comes to you. But at a certain point when you actually decide you're going to do this, you know, you have to know what that is. And, you know, just write it on your car, write it in card, leave it on your computer. And then you just constantly go, go back to that. Let that be your totem and let that get you back on track. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. As long as you're, you're good. There are a couple of people who are interested in other questions. You okay? I'm okay. Nat uh, Natalia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so I have always been um, super interested in movies that tell stories about true people and um, stories that actually happened. And so I've been, I've always been interested in the process of how someone approaches telling the story of someone who is real and someone who like a story that actually happened. And I was wondering if um, while you were writing about these characters and about Aretha, if you, there were ever moments where you're super nitpicky about certain dialogue or things like that to, in order to capture you know, who she was as a person or if you're more worried about just capturing the tone and aura of who she was. Um, I think initially I was, uh... You know, just because I had to get, had to get it down, uh, it was it was just about the tone and and um, you know sort of getting the story out. And then as as the drafts went on, getting really specific about the language and the time period and things like that. And you know, we had a the, um, we had a dialect coach, and also uh, Jennifer knew Aretha, so she knew the rhythm of her speech. So she was really ha actually ha helpful in uh, helping me to understand sort of how how she spoke. So uh, you know, all of that's the the sort of specificity of how people talked at that time you know that that was sort of added later i just sort of needed to get the ideas out first okay i didn't see here if natalia is still with us to, to say thank you perfect but yeah, sorry thanks <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to cut you off but we have ransom and ransom you'll finish us up all right, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I am. Perfect, okay. Um, mine's not much of a question. I was just going to say that you guys did a phenomenal job and I my favorite part, I believe, was just the music in the background. I just, the, the little bit of her talking and then the music in the background would just, just kind of sneak in. I just, I loved how much it just blended and I just thought it, it, it worked so well. So I just, I just wanted to say you guys did a very, very well job, so wanted to bring yeah. that up thank yeah. you thank you very much no problem um <laughs> okay <laughs> no 
I, I was ready to say, yeah, I thought you had something you were going to go. I, I, I well, was going to ask, but I, I was, yeah, you, I was, you, you can I, ask. I was going to ask how exactly in the script you write the, you, you're wanting more music. Like if, if you're, if your leader is telling you, you want more music to be playing in the background in the script, how exactly do you, how do you write more music? Because, you know, music is sound. So how do you, how do you write to get more music? If that makes sense is what I'm wondering. I mean, um, well, in this case, you know, obviously just because it's a with Franken, there's, there's just sort of more music than, than usual. So it's, it's, it's just that every every scene is sort of a, about music or about her creating music. Or about, so it's, it's just there. So uh, when, you know, when there, when there wasn't something directly in the script that said, you know, she's singing this or this is sort of this is happening, you know, a lot of it was, you know, filming in the collaborative is, you know, the, 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 the sound editor and the, the, the composer, you know, just sort of deciding uh, sort of how, where the music goes organically with this, uh, with, with certain scenes. Uh, but, you know, every scene that did have music, that, you know, that was sort of very specific and said, okay, we're going to play this song. And also, quite frankly, you, you have a list of songs and, you know, that you, that you could you could choose from and those that are not cost prohibitive you're allowed to use so there's, you know there's a lot of sort of factors but the, you know the, the the sound guy and stuff like that has, has a lot to do with it but if you think that there's a song or something that's very specific and important to the scene uh you should absolutely put that in there whether or not it gets in there or not because it indicates it indicates the director or something like that a mood or a tone all right well thank you all right, Tracy, thank you so much for taking the time, staying up so late with us and just sharing all this great information and writing such a great, beautiful movie and so many great shows. It's been a real pleasure. The one last thank question you. I, I want to yes. leave with you is, you know, we do this every month and next month, I, I, it's like I've curated this wonderful tribute to Aretha because next month we're watching the Amazing Grace documentary. So... And we're bringing in uh, Alan Elliott, who, who kind of brought all that together. So what should we be prepared for as we're watching that? I, uh, um, I watched that uh, documentary a bunch uh, when I was uh, writing it. And uh, what is so telling is that um, Aretha uh, barely speaks at all in the entire documentary. Uh, so, but her body language, in particular with her father, um, you know, with uh, James Cleveland, is just so telling. Um, where she gets emotional, knowing what I sort of knew at that after I researched her and then watching it again after that, uh, it was just there's just so much there's just so much there that's not said. I think that documentary is a really, a really powerful experience. Um, but there's just so much that's not said and it's, and it's just so clear how Aretha uh, just expresses herself through song uh, in, that, in that documentary, it's very powerful. Excellent, well, we're looking forward to that. Thank you so much, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Tracy, so much. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, for for everyone who's still with me, I, I um, again next month uh, we are doing uh, Amazing Grace documentary, so that'll be awesome. For those of you who are in the CineSkype class, tonight is due your prep. Uh, next week is due your thoughts and impressions about tonight about this project, this film, and um, I think it's like February sixth or something like that we'll do a prep night for uh amazing grace so all right we'll see you